So, welcome to number seven. Still looks similar to before. But uh, today will be kind of a little bit of an experiment. So, by popular request, and not only by some of you, but by some people who I have taught uh, similar classes before, uh, I always have students kind of t telling me, hey, would like to know how you'll know IoT actually works internally. So what's going on? So I don't want to make a shameless self-promotion here if, because I'm doing that all the time <laughs> in the other lectures. But uh, this is actually by demand that uh, students want to learn a little bit about what is going on internally. So how does actually an Internet of Things framework look like? And basically, how can I build my own? So, of course, so then, then I first thought, okay, I can just talk about it, kind of talk one and a half hours. I have no trouble talking one and a half hours just about my own framework, but I think that would be extremely boring for you guys. So it's not, it's kind of against my, my teaching ethics. So I split this up into small kind of mini research. So it's actually not as long as some of the things we have done before. But I will basically send you on to different passes to explore things in Yulno IoT. So I hope you all have internet and you all can actually see the uh, GitHub repository uh, of Yulno IoT. So we will actually, in the beginning, do a couple of things which might help you understand this yeah, layout and how these uh, system folders are set up. Then I will point you to my development platform I use to build your new IoT because you can use that for lots of other development things. And so even if you stop using your IoT, you want to actually probably later take another second look at platform IO. Then we'll look at the compilation process and the whole stuff culminates in gaining the knowledge how to write your own drivers and a little bit why multitasking is an issue in there. So I've given you a small example folder layout of uh, <coughs> Yulno IoT uh, yeah, system folder. So the system folder is called my house and there are two subfolders in there, living room and kitchen. Uh, and there's a, <coughs> also actually in, in these subfolders are device folder, uh, are node folders. So it leads one, leads two, toaster and coffee machine. And there's also a device folder just on the top. It's kind of the main, it's called main and it has a main switch. So that is for kind of switching off the power uh, in the whole house. And there's a system config uh, as usual in there. So in all of the node folders you see here, uh, which are the leaves, you would of course have also the node configs. But on the next slide, we will take a closer look at the node config. So, to, so feel free to look at the code and actually look in there or use the knowledge you have already gathered. But as a warm-up exercise, just five minutes, um, I want you, and you can do that with your neighbor if you want to, it might actually be nicer, uh, but still share the results because it needs to go, go back into the lecture notes. Um, yeah, if, if you have a layout of a system in your IT which looks like this, and now, I want to actually talk to some devices in there. How would I do this? So which topic uh, do I have to call um, if I want to switch on the coffee machine? And what do I have to send to it? You see actually coffee machine is down there. And so the coffee machine has different devices on there. So it has a coffee left, which is kind of an ultrasonic device, which looks how much coffee is still in the machine. Um, there's a milk left uh, in the coffee machine, which is actually a swimmer. Uh, and uh, kind of uh, actually switches on when there's no milk anymore uh, in there. And uh, there's a switch, yeah? And uh, the switch is an output, so you kind of know how an output usually works, takes on or off. And so how would you actually talk to this? Second question, uh, so how, how would you actually uh, make the light in the living room blue? All light, yeah. Um, and then how would you actually, what topic and command would you use to turn the main power off? While you do this, um, because you use these examples, derive a general rule from it. So how, 
how do the other topic names constructed? I had this question yesterday. Very often, uh, how uh, is actually can we figure out what topic is selected here? And then also look a little bit at the system.conf. And uh, you haven't touched this yet, but while you look at the code and how topics are constructed, maybe figure out what the role the system.conf plays and when you want to uh, change something in the system.conf. Okay, dive, dive in five minutes and try first to figure out how the topics are and then dig a little deeper. Please feel free to open the GitHub uh, from your IoT. Look at the bin folder. Look at deploy and there's also a file which is called readconfig which might enlighten you. No, no, no. This is just, this is just something I give you here as an example you have to apply. In Uno IoT, you only find the normal system template in lib. This is extra. This example is here for yeah, guiding you. You should also think about, is it actually relevant uh, how this top folder is called? If this is my house or something else. Would it be a difference if that would be your house? If you don't find the answer, write down questions. Yeah. If you're not sure, then have a good question instead. Okay. First thing, how do you switch on the coffee machine? What is the MQTT topic you have to use? That is the end of the topic. That's correct. But so how is the whole topic called? It starts with kitchen, yes? Yeah, kitchen and then kitchen slash coffee machine slash switch slash set. That's the whole topic. Very good. How do, what do I have to do set all the lights to blue in the living room? How many commands do I have to issue for that? I think just one with living room. Yeah, that would be nice. Actually, it doesn't work, but that would be a good feature request. So you actually do need to, I'm sorry, but it's, it was a trap I set here. So, <laughs> no, so, that, uh, so I tell, told you now, I need two. So and how are these two commands? What are the topics for the two commands? Is the command you have to send to it? Uh, set blue. Just blue. Just blue. You just set, uh, send the color to it. And send blue to living room slash lids one slash RGB slash set. Yeah? Because they are sub devices in the, uh, in the RGB lights. But after the set, I have to send blue to. Yeah, so the, the content, the payload is blue. Or you could also send 255, uh, no, uh, 0, 0, 0, uh, 255. Mm -hmm. uh, RGB and set is with a round line underscore in between, or is it just R, uh, slash RGB slash? It's slash, it's slash. slash. It's a sub device. And you later will learn what a sub device is. <laughs> yeah? So, and uh, how do I do the main power? Perfect. <laughs> you got it. So what is the so what is the rule? So how, how are topics formed in your new IoT? Where do you start? The folder where system dot you start where the system dot conf is exactly. And that's basically empty. That's the empty topic. So and then you go down from there. 
Um, so what, what if the coffee machine was its own room? So in the coffee machine would be several other uh, Vemoses installed. Yeah, so you, what happens then in, in total to the topic? You just have another layer. So the same, the same layer you see in the, in the folders here is the one you see in the topic too. And it's kind of written with the normal forward slash uh, in there. Um, good, so, in, uh, so we, we have now figured out from, from uh, to the devices, uh, to, to the nodes actually. So how, how are then the topics for the devices? So we have the node topic, and then we have the device topic. So how do we kind of get to the names of the devices? Where are, where does OnoIoT take these names from? From the folder, from the notes. Yeah, this is the, the the main topic, and then then we get something in there like lids and lids to. Where are you specifying these names? They're not in the folders, but yeah. Pardon? Yes, exactly. Instead of CPP, when you define the devices, you give these names. So where does then where do these names come from with the RGB strip that we have this RGB subtopic and it has also a brightness subtopic? Are you influencing these? <coughs> no, this is kind of hard coded by me. It's kind of a standard. Where do these things come from? I can tell you it's actually from a standard defined in Home Assistant. Home Assistant is a uh, uh, home automation framework and it has some defaults how it accesses MQTT devices and so this standard defined there is the reason why we have an RGB sub device why we have a brightness sub device and uh, use all these set topics it's kind of a agreement to do it this way and I uh, adhere to this agreement so what what can I do with the system.conf? We had the question, yeah. Uh, you can uh, configure an external Linux system. Yeah, so w w tell me when you would like to do something to the system.conf. Give me an example when um, you... When I don't have a Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. I use instead of this uh, uh, Linux on board on a virtual machine or something. Yeah, or you have even, uh, you can run your MQTT server on Windows and you have just a normal, um, you might have just a normal uh, router, so you don't have the router built into the, to the Raspberry Pi. Then you can use another Linux machine or a virtual machine to configure your IoT. But if it's not on the machine where you actually have the router, you have to specify in the system.con where it is or you can use several machines so several people in your house or in your factory or where you deploy it could actually be able to configure things but of course they need the keys of the devices because only then these devices can be updated um, what does this uh, position of the system.com influence so what would happen if I would move the system.com on the same level as uh, my house. So basically one folder up, system conf would go one folder up. Different houses. Yeah, so you could actually manage different houses and then the house would be part of the MQTT topic, yeah? So the, the algorithm is it goes up to find the system to conf and from there it constructs the topic. Good, so let's take a look at the nodes. Maybe we just do five minutes here too. So what can we do in the node.conf versus the system.conf? And how do config.text, so the boot config.text, which we have on the Raspberry Pi, the etc. you'll know iot.conf, system.conf, and finally the node.conf, influence the environment variables which we use in compiling things for your no IoT. So you have to dig, or maybe 10 minutes is better, so you have to dig a little bit into the code, probably start with read config and also look at deploy to figure that out.
and your notes go to lecture notes, same as usual. So for our international viewers, just a hint, if you have the repository here, you can use the general search and for example, look for config.txt and then you want to say in this repository. And then you, for example, find this read boot config where it refers to the config.txt. This here you might have seen. This is the config.bash, and they see there's lots of stuff defined in there, which you might need now for reference. So let's go back uh, to the initial question. For <coughs> what can you do in the node.com? What can you change is the node.com? So per node. I can set the board type, yes. What else? There are a couple of options are right exposed in that template. In the node. What, what else can you change per node in the node.com? Not in the node.com, you can do it in the setup.cpp, you can add the devices. You have seen this. Let's go to the actual, make another instance of this. So you have seen under lib, pretty sure system template, node template, node.conf. Ah, okay, I have taken that out. Um, what you can do in there is the same thing as in the, in the system template. Yeah, so I've seen this. So everything you see in here can also be in the node. Yeah, so then to extend the question, what can you change in the system.conf? You see that here. Yeah, so we have seen, we can set the access point, we can set the password, but we can also set the MQTT host. Yeah, so we can basically have for different uh, systems the MQTT host, but all these variables you see here actually carry over to the node.com. Yeah, so basically all the variables you see in your no IoT can be specified at any time. So and basically when we look at these different configuration files, it's just about the order when they are sourced. Yeah, so you can basically all the variables which are defined in your IoT, which you see here in this which you see here in this um, in this definition file. So you see here uh, password, channel, IP, hidden bridge, host, user, password, and all this stuff. We can in principle set at any point. So that means actually we can even set a, a username and a password for a node to uh, that this node actually uses different username and password to uh, access MQTT. Yeah, so that's maybe the most important <coughs> parameter you might actually change per node if you want to add security. So you can get that one node can only uh, access specific topics on the MQTT server. And you can do that with, uh, no, not with the, this here, but here with MQTT user and MQTT password. Why does this work? So how is the mechanics of actually reading configuration files? Has anybody of you looked into the read config? So let's go to read config. Yeah, 
Yeah, so that is actually reading the node config. And uh, you will see that the node config sources first the system config. So if we go further, look at the system config. And um, what does it do here? It finds the system config and then, so it goes up the, the folders, finds the system config and then sources the system config. And then system config, after that we actually read the boot config. The boot config goes to the config.txt. Yeah? So first we read the, uh, let's go back to the slide. So when you start Yulno IoT as a <coughs> shell command, kind of going into the Yulno IoT environment, this and this is red. Yeah? So that are kind of the general environment variables of it. Then if you actually compile something or deploy something, then it reads the system config, which in itself checks again the config or text. And then you read the node config and everything. In, it, in all these files, you can have the same variables. So just the node conf in the end overrides everything. Yeah, so it's just, you can use the same variables everywhere, uh, but the order is basically I read this one first, then I read this one, then I uh, read this one, and then I read this one. And so anything you specify in node config might override everything before. And this way you can basically have a configuration per node, but everything in the hierarchy over on top of it is general setting for all the elements in there. Okay, I give you kind of a break in searching. So I do something which I wanted to do the last two lectures, but didn't work out. So you remember two lectures ago, we had uh, this feature description from Ulna IoT. Yes. And you know, uh, as I have made you look deeper in the mechanics, you have a bit more of an idea. So you had to um, write down a list two lectures ago with all the features you want to have in an Internet of Things system. And we wanted to compare this with Ulna IoT. And uh, so if you haven't done that uh, yet, I want you to kind of take a look at your own notes and do it now. So check the features you have and kind of tick off how many of these features. So count the total number of features you have uh, and check off from these features how many uh, of your preferred features are actually supported in your IoT. And then I want this in a percentage. Yeah. How many of your features, how many, how many percent of your features are actually uh, supported in your IoT? And then I want a little hand count and then I feel either bad or great afterwards. Yeah. Yes. It's MIT license. You can even make it commercial and the only thing you have to do is give me credit for it. You have to say that's the stuff from, from your IT, but you can make your own product out of it. Uh, yesterday you told us that um, the Arduino Studio is also compatible. Pretty cool. Uh, I'll show you a platform I That's the next thing you see. But it is debuggable. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> nah, debuggable in quotation marks. <laughs> Depends on the microcontroller. <laughs> the ESP8266, not so well. Okay, two minutes, yeah? That should be fast. You have all this list with your no IoT and just count. That was task. You can even estimate, you don't have to do the exact percentage. If you have nine features you want and five are supported by Yolno IT, it's more than 50%.
The security is probably partly implemented, yeah? <laughs> you have to decide if you give credit to it or not. <laughs> You have now seen that there's something with usernames and passwords, which you didn't know before. Okay, let's, let's ask. Um, how many of you uh, have more than 50%, so more than half of their uh, features is implemented with your loyalty? Oh, that looks good. Okay, I do the other way around, less than 50%. Okay, we guys have to talk. <laughs> and uh, more than more than 70%. None? Okay, then. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, everybody who has less than 50% needs to ask some questions on the you all know IoT chat channel and say, hey, is this supported and how? <laughs> Yeah, so I want all of you, you had less than 50% to ask for some of the features and then maybe we can turn them into feature requests. Okay, one or two, one or two of the missing features. Like a nice user interface. Okay. My, <laughs> it's just deploy and initialize. <laughs> Uh -huh. But yeah, with Node Red, it's partly supported. So, how was this whole thing possible? So, I used Python actually before. For the first uh, iterations of Yolno IDT, I did Python and basically used PyCharm to develop it. So, during that time, one other platform became vastly popular, which is Platform.io. So, uh, I will show it to you in a short time, but I want you first to check it out. So Google Platform IO and check out what it is. Is it actually an Internet of Things development platform? Does it fulfill all your dreams? What features does it have? Check it out. You might want to install it, <laughs> but make your own opinion. You have found something about it. What is Platform IO? Can it be an IoT framework. <laughs> it's an extension for, um, to, also to uh, develop, uh, uh, especially for IoT. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so you, you, you put it kind of close to Ardu Arduino IDE. What, how does it compare to the Arduino IDE? I mean, even Arduino IDE claims to be an IoT framework. So. If Arduino IDE claims it, I think Platform.io can too, isn't it? What's cool about Platform.io? What does it claim? So what can you already guess by just reading the promotional material about it? You can simply debug stuff. <laughs> yeah, if the device supports it, yes. But, and you can, debug, you can debug simple devices which support the debugging if you pay a lot of money because the debugging is actually the commercial part in platform IO. So that sounds pretty really nice. Um, in reality, yeah, I think if you have a company developing IoT devices, I think platform IO might be great because of the debugging uh, features. I agree with you. However, for us, it's not really in reach. Uh, you can test it for months, but it uh, doesn't work yet um, uh, for free. And it doesn't work on the ESP8266 as it doesn't work on a lot of uh, simple Arduino devices. But on, for example, the ESP32 and a lot of Atmel uh, and ARM devices, it does actually work and, and can debug and enforce itself. But the issue is still, we can only debug one device. So we cannot really do the network debugging uh, lots, like lots of devices at once because there are basically a very, very <laughs> few debug features which can test the whole system. We can test devices, but uh, it's hard to test systems. So we can test nodes, but not so well systems. But still, what is the cool feature in terms of device support? <laughs> so it's a very unified approach actually in developing for multiple platforms at the same time. So platform IO supports a lot of, platform, uh, a lot of different hardware platforms. So that's actually really nice.
Did you read something about the dependency in library management? So it does actually a really good job in finding libraries and, uh, and uh, downloading them automatically and managing them, updating them, so you don't have to take care of this, which you kind of do very manually in Arduino you know, IDE, Platform IO here does for you. There's a very active forum, and it's kind of, for me, always the second step. So you start with Arduino IDE, and then if you want to become serious, you'd use Platform IO. Why? I will show you now. No, that's Platform IO. So it's basically a plugin for uh, Visual Studio Code. And so usually you start uh, either importing your old Arduino projects or you do a new project and then you can actually here select one of the 566 supported boards so we can actually see huh what about the Vemos and uh, there you find the D1 mini and everything your heart desires in there so but let's switch to something ready-made Mm. So this here is actually uh, a pre-compiled node from Yolno IoT. And the cool thing is this doesn't really directly support debugging, but it makes developing so much easier. So if we look at the setup CPP file, basically, um, you can see here the commands we actually have defined and now you can do great things like you can press the control key and click on output and then you see output is defined uh, here in this device uh, 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 and then if you look at output where is the output and yeah, so there's, a, there's the output class, then you can click on the output class and they are actually at the de definition of the output class. And then you can see what it actually supports. And so basically you can click and see the documentation and the way it's formatted very, very quickly. If I compile things and probably it compiles now actually through. So it's the same thing you see when you, when you type deploy, a uh, little bit more color. Uh, let's make a mistake here and uh, yeah, let's forget the, the semicolon. Then you can actually uh, really click on the arrow and you can see, so now you see here we have actually problems and uh, oh, uh, somewhere here we, okay, doesn't find where it actually is missing. Uh, we basically see that it uh, that we had an, a semicolon missing here and usually you can click on it and be at the position but because I have this nasty macros here and devices it actually ends up in devices. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah you if you if you use external libraries so I was working on the scale for example you can uh, it automatically shows you also the external libraries you use you can jump there uh, it has command completion, so it kind of speeds up your development, I don't know, by factor 10 or something like that. So, uh, especially if I, uh, if you use internal variables, you don't have to type them out all the time. So it's like a real IDE uh, where, you, where you can add, add stuff. So if you want to take it on and actually want to use libraries and not only one C file, it's definitely something you take a look at. Is it an IoT framework? I think it would not score too high. And of course, it's an IDE, you can develop everything in there, but it only helps in actually building that. It's not a total framework. So there are some deployment functions in there for single nodes, but the system element is really not covered in there. And that's, I think, where Yulno IoT covers a little bit more. But Yulno IoT is developed in Platform IO. So I have to give credit where credit is due here. But debugging, guys, yes. If somebody wants to do a PhD thesis in uh, debugging IoT systems, let's talk after you have done your master's and <laughs> want to go on there. Because I think doing that as a master's thesis might be already uh, cutting it very close. 
So debugging better means only, yeah, I can develop easier code. I can follow the code quicker and uh, can develop quicker. So it's not so much in terms of debugging what we can do here. So now things get complicated. Um, trace deploy. Yeah, so check out how you'll know IoT is actually compiling something. When you, what happens if you call deploy? And also answers a question we, because some, some people have failed. Why can only one deploy run at once? And why is this actually a benefit and not a restriction? So what's the good thing about only running one deploy at once? The bad thing we have already experienced. That is a hard question, so I don't know if you can solve it, but I hope you kind of get there. So start with deploy, see what it calls. The read config you have understood already, that's more the most complicated thing, but there's something with preparing a directory, which is what you want to trace. Okay, let's discuss. What does all IoT do when it compiles something? When you call deploy in the, in a folder somewhere up there, have you kind of gotten an idea what are the steps? The first thing we have already figured out, it kind of figures out the configuration of the node. Yeah, so it reads the config and does all the variables overriding and stuff to figure out what this is not. What is the next thing? did basically show that to you. It prepares this weird compile cache, yeah? What is happening in, in comparing the compile cache? It links all the source code right together, but where does it take the source code from for creating the compiled cache? Have you figured that out? It all comes from lib node types. Yeah, so something similar with the overwriting happens there. So the, if you look at if you look at the uh, if you look here at the node types, the node types depending on the board you have, it starts at something. So if you, for example, take the Vimos D1 Mini, then it gets basically its source here, but before it copies this source, it looks here at the base, which is a link to uh, the ESP8266. So you see, Vimos Day One Mini is an ESP8266. So basically, then it first links to all the sources in ESP8266, and there's where most my developing work uh, is. So this is where you have to look later in the last exercise, where all the drivers are defined. And then it copies the things which are different. So if you look at Vimos D1 Mini, the only thing which is different are the pins. Yeah, everything else is just the ESP8266. The only thing which is specific are the pins. And that's why we kind of looked up sometimes in between uh, the specifics of the pins because he had also kind of tells you what is SCL and what is SDA in there. Okay, so we have figured that one out. So then link, it links it and then it compiles it, but it links it always to the same cache directory. Yeah, and then it actually, when it has kind of compiled the source folder together, so kind of linked everything to the right place. It also creates the configurations. So it also take, creates the Wi-Fi config and the global config. Yeah, so it creates a C file, a config C file. So if you look actually at the code, you see that uh, in the preparation, so if you look here at the prepare build here, it not only does all the link through stuff, but you see here, it also creates the Wi-Fi config, and here it, calls, it creates the config.h, the general stuff. 
which actually, as you see here, has the host name, MQTT topic, MQTT server, user password, and here it has the access point and Wi-Fi password in there. So that's also happening when it actually creates the directory. And this is why it would overwrite things all the time in there. So, but, so uh, yeah, why, why can we, why does this method only allow us to run one deploy? I think you figured that out. Because it uses the same command cache. Yes. And it overrides it. And if you uh, start deploying twice, uh, you override this. Both so what should I do at least? to prevent you guys from being confused. I should, I should have a lock, which kind of tells you <laughs> there is something. So that's some issue one of you could actually create on GitHub and ask for a lock and some things. So why did I do that? Why don't I create compile caches for every node? And that would prevent it. Then you could actually run things in parallel if I would just make it cache per node. And I did this before. Huh? So I did this and then I decided against it. Why could that be a choice a developer makes? Or a teacher who teaches developing? <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that that would not the teacher make but the businessman that's a good thing we sell the parallel thing it's partly a bit true but i didn't take it away for that but it's a good idea we could definitely rethink how we could support the parallel programming here so what else could be have you seen how long the initial so one of with one of you i ran yesterday the update cache with which group were this how long did it take? Um, 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, and this was kind of for five platforms, so it was basically 10 minutes per platform. So you actually did compile five different nodes. And so you see, basically making a new node, uh, the initial compile takes 10 minutes on the Raspberry Pi. And you have experienced how fast actually the deploy is it's more like one minute yeah it's a bit faster than i think even the arduino on your fast pcs so my choice of using one cache directory was speed i wanted you not to wait too often 10 minutes i wanted you to usually wait just one minute if you do a deploy um it also saves a lot of space so there's it isn't replicating so much so that's the second reason why you want to do that but the main reason here is speed so you actually so you, it sounds counterintuitive you can actually be faster if you do single pro, single processing so sometimes this can be fa much much faster ah sorry okay um, we have to shorten that. No, we look at this and we do the next exercise directly. So there is one, so UNRT is object oriented. So there's one device class, which everything in UNRT is derived from device. So for the next exercise here, you want to actually uh, look at device. So while you look at the device, you want to look at what are the common function, the device supports. Uh, so you will actually discover some things to interact with your new IoT devices, which you haven't seen so far and which are not officially documented, but might come in handy when you uh, program your future devices. One of you might want to Google what the fluent interface is. You have seen the dot with stuff I use, which is kind of a software engineering clue of doing funky things with objects. So you, one of you might Google what fluent interface is. So what are the virtual functions in device? So if you def define your own device, which functions do you have to overwrite? Uh, in which order are these overwritten functions called? And what is a sub-device? So you really want to actually figure out what a sub-device is and look at the output driver as an example. 
But actually you should do this and do actually the other one as a secondary task. So how do we write our own you all know IoT driver? So check at the check the analog driver and see how it works. Yeah? Note down the remarkable features. Then look at the I square C device, which is a derivation of uh, the device. And what does it add to the device? And then really take a look at the new VL53L0X. This is the distance device which we will need for your scale experiments now. And um, yeah, Google a little bit how you would actually implement, based on knowing this one, another I square C device. Yeah, so I square C devices all kind of function quite similarly. Um, so you would basically check out the BMP 180 or the TSL 2561 or the MPR 121. Uh, just pick one at random and kind of try to develop a small strategy how you would now write a device driver for it. So I hope at the end of the class we will actually have contributions from all of you for the BMP uh, 180, TSL 2561 and MPR 121. Check it out. In group or With neighbor. neighbor. <laughs> but you can use both your left and right neighbor if you want. So I would just want you guys talking. So please feel free to uh, divide and conquer this process. Yeah, you probably all need to understand device a little bit. <laughs> but you can do it by re reverse. So you can start with one of the drivers and then go into device when you need to understand what is called there. Source code overkill. <laughs> so I have to start wrap up a little bit the lecture here. So I will give you some more clues uh, where you want to look. Let's take and check this out. So if we look at the devices. So have you figured out what a sub device is? It's a class, but uh, uh, which class uses the the sub device class? The device class. So let's look at the output, and then you see uh, where it's actually used. Um, I think it's CPP. So if you see in the constructor from output. It creates two sub-devices. So when you see one sub-device is called set. Does that ring a bell for you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so basically the subtopics of these devices are defined here. Yeah? So if it actually and then you can actually see you can use a sub-device and connect a callback to it. Yeah? So if you, it's an actually not a sensor but an actor, you can have this special topic where it adds here one. Or if you look at the temperature humidity stuff, then you can actually see that it also defines here two subdevices, a temperature and a humidity subdevice. And that kind of adds to the construction of the topic where it reports or where it subscribes and receives thing. If I add a callback, it's a subscription. If not, I just get another value which I can define. Okay, and then very quickly check out the new um, distance sensor. Where is that distance? So you see, this is actually an I square C device, and this I square C device doesn't have a start and a measure. It has an I square C start and a, and a measure, which has to be overwritten, and. So you might have figured out, okay, first we have a constructor where just variables are saved. Then the actual physical start of devices, kind of initializing the bus, kind of setting uh, something as an input or an output is actually done in start. In the I2C device, before that, the I2C device automatically selects the right bus for you and resets the bus in its start so that you get some benefit in not having to deal with managing several I2C buses. I2C device does this for you. And then 
uh, in measure is actually the actual measuring uh, thing where we get a device and publish this device for ulnoiarity. So if you look here at the implementation of it, so you see actually in start, there's a lot of stuff with hardware going on so that some kind of initial things are sent over the bus and some waiting goes on. And then in measure, um, it actually reads a value from the um, here. It reads a value from the driver. We have the, the library we actually include here. And then if this is a new value uh, and no timeout has occurred, we write into measured value this value. And having something in measured value and then returning true called, tells Ulno IoT that this has to be published and this is available for use in the upper layer. So these are the three things, constructor, stored, and measure you have to implement to make a, your own driver. So let's look at the, let's look at the uh, task for today. This is not so hard. Um, mainly work on project two. Um, you might want to use this new driver uh, in ULNO IoT to do some of the measurements with the time of flight sensor. Uh, also, a very important call two times ULNO IoT upgrade in your environment because there are some new drivers coming in and to fix things. So, if some of you have done that yesterday, but the others just call ULNO IoT upgrade twice then you automatically get the new drivers and it fixes things for you. Optional, if you have time today, let's work on the scale. Uh, but I have some things with Nikolaus I want to check out first before I officially uh, want to put you guys on the scale. So that might be <laughs> something you only start in the end today or uh, do tomorrow. Yeah, but apart from that, project two, do a lot of stuff with water, dirt water and uh, oil. And I want to see you see you guys being pre creative and doing measurements. In principle, it doesn't matter how you measure. If you use the Arduino IDE, if you use Ulno IoT for it, it's about figuring out what are the best measuring uh, IoT devices for which purpose. Yeah. So it's goal driven. We want to find a solution for my friend Bill how to get all the measurements in his boat, and uh, we can think about the network later but we want to find the right devices okay 